Hello, and thank you for watching. Well, I've decided I'm not a very big fan of the book of Jeremiah. I find it depressing and somewhat difficult. We have this prophet who's called to preach a message of judgment that will result in death and destruction. This prophet is told at the outset that your audience is not going to listen to you, and then the message he preaches gets him put in jail and almost killed. Things are bad in Jerusalem, and they're only going to get worse. God is bringing the Chaldean army, and through them the streets are going to be full of dead men. The cities of Judah will be a waste, a place without man nor beast, desolate, no buffalo roaming, no deer and antelope playing. And by the end of the book, Jerusalem has fallen, the temple is torched, and the people are marched off to exile. And yet two times in this lengthy book, God speaks of a righteous branch springing up for David, a wise king who will bring justice and righteousness to Israel. In fact, this anointed one will be called, the Lord is my righteousness, according to chapter 23, verse 6. And so even in the present darkness, there seems to be a glimmer of hope for the future. The second time we hear of this righteous branch is in our reading for today. Jeremiah chapter 33. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will fulfill the promise I made to the house of Israel and the house of Judah. In those days and at that time, I will cause a righteous branch to spring up for David, and he shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In those days, Judah will be saved and Jerusalem will dwell securely. And this is the name by which it will be called, the Lord is our righteousness. For thus says the Lord, David shall never lack a man to sit on the throne of the house of Israel, and the Levitical priest shall never lack a man in my presence to offer burnt offerings, to burn grain offerings, and to make sacrifices forever. The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. Thus says the Lord, if you can break my covenant with the day and my covenant with the night so that day and night will not come at their appointed time, then also my covenant with David, my servant, may be broken so that he shall not have a son to reign on his throne and my covenant with the Levitical priests, my ministers. As the host of heaven cannot be numbered and the sands of the sea cannot be measured, so I will multiply the offspring of David, my servant, and the Levitical priests who minister to me. The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. Have you not observed that these people are saying the Lord has rejected the two clans that he chose? Thus they have despised my people so that they are no longer a nation in my sight. Thus says the Lord, if I have not established my covenant with day and night and the fixed order of the heaven and the earth, then I will reject the offspring of Jacob and David my servant and will not choose one of his offspring to rule over the offspring of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, for I will restore their fortunes and will have mercy on them. There will be death and terror, deprivation and sorrow, and it's going to be everywhere. Think about the pictures that you and I are seeing these days from Ukraine, the pictures of bombed out cities and scorched earth hillsides. And yet at the very moment when God's judgment reaches its depth, he speaks this unexpected word of hope. God remembers the promise he made to David more than 400 years earlier, and he brings to Israel words of healing and security, words of prosperity and joy. Verse 1 of the chapter tells us that Jeremiah is receiving this word while in prison. It reminds us of Paul who wrote letters from prison. Sometimes the light of God's word comes to people in their darkest hours. The question then begs to be asked, are we headed for dark times? And if so, then maybe this word is also for us. I ran across a couple of articles this week, one from the New York Times, blaming Christians for all the senseless mass shootings that it's the Jesus people who wrap themselves in the flag and the Constitution as they yammer on about their rights to carry a gun. The second article I read was written by a Catholic cardinal who was bemoaning the growing number of church fires around the country. People are torching church buildings 
to protest the Christian stance against prenatal murder and homosexuality. Secular culture is trying hard to get Jesus out of the picture, if you haven't noticed. Christians are increasingly blamed for the sad state of our country. So, yes, it is possible for the church today to be persecuted, just as it was in the days of Peter and Paul. Our text for today challenges us with an important question. Who are we going to believe? The word of the secular prophets or the word of God? In Jeremiah, it's the secular prophets who claim to speak for God. They've declared that everything's fine, all is well, peace, prosperity, and security. But their tune has changed of late. They now say that all hope is lost, that the Lord has rejected the two kingdoms he chose. God says, don't listen to the talking heads. I've not abandoned my people at all. Yes, times are dark. They need to be dark because my people have disobeyed me. But the days are coming when I will fulfill the promise I made to David. In fact, look at how each paragraph of the text begins. Declares the Lord. Thus says the Lord. The word of the Lord. And again, the word of the Lord. In the age of a 24-hour news cycle, we're going to have to decide, church, who are we going to listen to? Who will we allow to set the tone for our lives? In dark times, who we believe? CNN? Fox News? MSNBC? Are we going to believe the God of creation who makes promises? He made a promise to Israel. And folks, he also makes a promise to us that my Messiah is coming to save the day. The righteous branch of David came some 500 years after Israel was brought back from Babylonian exile. He is the king who today sits on David's throne and will sit on that throne forever. He is the prophet promised to Moses. He is the priest who offered the final sacrifice for sin. This king does what all those other failed kings couldn't and didn't do. He acted righteously and defended justice, especially those who'd been treated unjustly. And the text says, in those days, Judah will be saved and Jerusalem will live in safety. And so to be safe and secure and prosperous and happy, the people of God need a leader who does what is right and just. A king, a prophet, and a priest who speaks truth. In the fullness of time, God sent forth his son, the son of David, and he did everything promised here in Jeremiah 33. But he did it in so much greater way than even the prophets could have imagined. This son would be rejected by his countrymen because he didn't restore the fortunes of Israel the way they wanted him to. Instead, Jesus restored the kingdom of God to the entire world. And he is currently in the process of bringing that kingdom to its ultimate glory on that last day. All who put their hope in this righteous branch are put right in their relationship to God. They are counted righteous by the one who is righteous. But this branch also brings a kingdom filled with righteousness and justice. He promises to one day reconcile us to one another as he also brings reconciliation to his creation in the new heaven and new earth. This is not the secular hope that drives our modern culture. This is the gospel hope centered on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Let's call him by the name given here. The Lord is our righteousness. In fact, Jeremiah sounds a lot like Paul, doesn't he? But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. The righteousness of God in Jesus Christ declares us righteous in God's eyes and makes us righteous in God's world. The Lord alone is our righteousness. We look back to the fulfillment of Jeremiah's surprising promise in Jesus' first coming, and then we look 
ahead to the brave new creation the promised branch will bring in his second coming. It all sounds like nonsense to the talking heads on the TV news and the secularists who foolishly glory in human potential only to wallow in the mire of human failure. But this is what the Lord says, and it is as certain as the stars of the night, as sure as tomorrow's sunrise. God will do it.